morning, church family, and I want to thank you for choosing to join us again today. As most of you know, we've been working our way through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And over the past few weeks, we've looked at a number of, of different comparisons that Jesus has made between the old way of doing religion and this new kingdom that he came to establish. Over the past two weeks in particular, Jesus has just given the people five very relevant examples of how he came to literally fulfill the law. I think it's fair to say that his message was starting to sink in to that crowd. But today, as we close off Matthew chapter 5, we're going to experience together Jesus teaching the crowd something that would have been a, a brand new concept. I think you'd agree that for most of us, it's easy to love our families. It's easy for us to love our friends. It's easy for us to, to love those people that are nice to us and kind to us. But Jesus is about to explain something to this crowd about what it means to love your enemies. For a lot of them, it probably didn't sit very well. In fact, for all of them, it would have been a brand new concept. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, as that's the passage that we're going to unpack just a little bit later. But before we get into that, let's enter into this worship together. Oh 
During the month of January, we introduced you to a new feature of our online services where we wanted to highlight one of our supported missionaries or supported missions organizations. This month, we're going to highlight the ministry of Pathway. Now, our church has, has worked alongside Pathway for a number of years, and many of you have enjoyed being part of the ministry during the summer months as we've assembled teams to go work alongside the Pathway leadership, specifically in Easterville. We've asked Jenny and Stefan to give us an update on how COVID has impacted the camp this past year and how the camps might look just a little bit different this upcoming summer. Hi, Pastor Bruce, Jenna, everyone at Oak Bank. Good morning. It's uh, Pathway People, Jenny and me, Stefan. Just in case some of you guys don't know us, so this is Jenny, my wife. Uh, she's uh, right, She came from Toronto to uh, Mooseor and Manitoba, and I'm from Montreal, French-Canadian, just in case you don't know us. We are kind of the leaders for Pathway, and uh, we were asked by your leaders to do a small update, so that's what we're going to do through video, a quick uh, short video. And also, I'm going to attach in the email a copy of the video we show at camp. So if you want to show both videos, it's up to you. So regarding Pathway, of course, COVID touched us a lot. Um, before COVID, we did lots of camps. Uh, spring break and summer, we went to uh, uh, youth retreats. and We went to uh, different reserve for uh, youth programs and so on. But uh, COVID kind of stopped all of the regular stuff. So we were force uh to go through just uh, interaction with kids and communities and uh, some churches uh through internet and phone basically and so we uh since uh september actually we're kind of off the payroll and we're just doing our the stuff through internet basically and but we're looking forward that uh, this uh summer probably we will uh restart a COVID camp type of thing so it's going to be uh, different and we're starting to talk to different reserves we talked to the chief uh, in uh, Mr. Easter, not Chief Easter. So he's up to now, seems to be really uh, looking forward to a different camp with uh, a lot of restrictions, maybe less ca less kids and maybe lunch bags and so on. So we're looking forward to that, uh, to uh, talk to all the churches and try to find uh, the best program possible. Uh, of course, we can't decide 100% for now because we don't know COVID uh, the way it's going to be. But... Um, we're happy to learn that a lot of the reserve, uh, the elders were uh, received the actual vaccine, and it's and also the front. Uh, how do you say front, front line workers? Front, front line workers there, and so it's look it's looking that by this summer most of them will get the vaccine. That's what I've been told up to now. So that's great. Um, regarding uh, different needs we have, of course, it was a bit tougher uh, financially. Uh, we didn't get any funds throughout the year uh, from the different reserves that usually gives us some of the funds to uh, for pathway to survive and so on. So that's why we're saying we, uh, me and Jenny, were off the books for a while. And uh, but uh, God is good. God provided, and uh, we are sure that God will provide, depending uh, what uh, what type of camp we're going to have this summer and so on. Also, another thing you could pray about, and is uh, we are. Uh, we will be looking for somebody to help us out for sure, uh, a youth leader or a leader or depending what God provides. And we could, we wanted to do it before, uh, but because of COVID, we postponed that search. Uh, so if you know anybody who would like to uh, be uh, a main leader for, for Pathway, let us know. So these are the main two things. So yes, of course, this summer, the camps will be a bit more expensive because of the gloves and the mask and all the things, uh, the liquids that we have to buy for the hands and and so on and we're going to have more kids uh because we will accept maybe only 25 kids every day but in total we'll have more kids more t-shirts and more i don't know this and that so so just pray for us our health uh, or uh that we have the wisdom to do the good thing and your leaders uh when we meet and so on and uh, we wanted to do a joint churches uh, brainstorming uh, in the past we postponed that because of covid so but at one point soon We'd like to do a some sort of brainstorming, so how to restart Pathway and how to be better in the future. Maybe, uh, for example, instead of us going every week to uh, uh, Fairford and Grand Rapids, maybe less of that and more of 
visiting at least two or three times each of the communities that we've, you know, like uh, Easterville and Barron's and Blood Vein and so on uh, instead. Uh, so that's an example. So anyway, so pray for us. And I will let uh, Jenny uh, pray at the end. So Jenny, if you have anything else to say that I forgot to say, and you want to, or you want to pray, ball is in your camp. <laughs> I'll just pray then. <laughs> All right, Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are with all of us, Lord, though we are um, apart and we are uh, with each other online, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you can be with every single one of us, and we thank you that you continue to take care of us, Lord, especially in this time of pandemic. And uh, Lord, we just uh, commit everything into your hands, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for a church family, Lord. And we thank you for Oak Bank. We thank you for the pastors and the various people, Lord, who have put their heart and support, Lord, uh, behind Pathway. And we ask, oh Lord Jesus, that as things have started, Lord, conversations have begun, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your will be accomplished, Lord. And especially, Lord, we pray, Father, for those out in Easterville, Lord. We pray, Father, for the children. We pray especially for the parents, Lord, that many would come to know you, Lord. And as we're thinking, as we're talking about what can be done, Lord, we know so much has to do with COVID. So, Lord, we ask that you would please bring it to an end, Lord. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that uh, you would raise up, Lord Jesus, uh, the various volunteers. Give us good ideas, Lord, on how to go forward. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are with us. You are our helper. And, and um, we just thank you, Lord, that we can put everything into your hands. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you very much for listening. And, of course, pray for the kids uh, in Easterville. Uh, at least one good news is Easterville for, uh, has a lot less case of COVID than a lot of our other reserves, like uh, Garden Hill has hundreds and hundreds of cases. So uh, at least, you know, uh, you're, uh, you're praying for Easterville and, uh, and they seem to be doing well. So, But keep it on, please. And uh, looking forward to see you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye. Okay, kids, it's time for a special feature just for you. And I'm especially excited this morning because I get to introduce you to a very special friend of mine, and his name is Scruff. Now, Scruff has been struggling with this whole idea of what it means to love your enemies. But thankfully, his very good friend, Roz, was able to help him with that. Take a look at this. Party, 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 oh, party, thanks, Graf. What's party. up? Oh, hey, Ros. Oh, nothing much. We're just gonna have a big party for all my friends. Cool. What's the occasion? Occasion? No, no occasion. I just oh. thought I should do something nice for all my friends. I, I am a loving dog. Oh, yeah. well, that is very loving of you, yeah. Scruff. Oh, I think so. Uh, hey, you know what? what? We're going to read a part of the Bible that's actually about loving people. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Oh, is this still that Jesus guy up the mountain teaching these people about how to live God's way? You bet, yep. Oh. So let's see what Jesus says. Okay. Okay, he says, You have heard people say, love your neighbours and hate your enemies. Oh, he's a good teacher, that Jesus, isn't he? Love. Love, 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 love. Great <laughs> okay, teacher. okay, so you think that's a good thing to do, Scruff? Oh, I think it's an awesome thing to do. I mean, that's what my party is all about. Loving my friends. Look, I've right. got Clarence and Percival and Grancherina and Reginald. Okay, Beryl okay, and Scruff, that's really nice, but Jesus didn't just mean love the people next door. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not just inviting them, I'm also inviting Trevor. I mean, he lives out in the country now. Uh, and Leroy, he's from Neptune. And okay. then they've got Percy. Okay, got... okay, Scruff, you are obviously very loving. Oh, I think so. <laughs> but I think. I think we should keep reading. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. So it says, You have heard people say, love your neighbours and hate your enemies. Yeah. But, but I tell you to love your enemies and pray for anyone who mistreats you. <laughs> uh, I'm wrong. I think you made a mistake. I think you just said, love your enemies. <laughs> That's okay. That's no, it's right. rough. I didn't make a mistake. Did That's you? what Jesus said. What? Yep. I tell you to love your enemies and pray for anyone who mistreats you. What? Love your, love your enemies? What are you talking about? Why would you love your enemies? What, does Scruff, do you even have any enemies? Yeah. Cavendish. <laughs> Cavendish. Yeah. He's the cat that lives next door. Oh, he's so <laughs> mean. He always steals my food and he sometimes scratches me on the nose. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, he, he is my mortal enemy. Well, Jesus says to love your enemies. But why? Why would you do that? I mean, enemies are mean. Enemies are annoying. Enemies. Why would you love them? Well, because Jesus says, then you will be acting like your father in heaven. Huh? Yeah, see, God's way is different. Huh? Let, let's keep reading. He makes the sun rise on both good and bad people. And he sends rain for the ones who do right and for the ones who do wrong. If you love only those people who love you, will God reward you for that? Even tax collectors, oh, oh they, they're like school bullies. Yeah, even tax collectors love their friends. If you greet only your friends, what's so great about that? Don't even unbelievers do that? But you must always act like your father in heaven. Everybody loves people who already love them. I mean, that's easy. But Jesus is saying to love people even who are hard to love. Yeah, but that sounds really, really hard. Well, well yeah, actually, yeah, loving your enemies is really, really hard. Wait a second. You said Jesus said this, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, but Jesus, he doesn't know what it's like because he doesn't have any enemies. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, Scruff, of course Jesus has enemies. Let, let's read another verse of the Bible. It's okay. from Romans right. uh, chapter 5, verse 10. Okay. It says, even when we were God's enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us. Okay. See, Jesus did love his enemies. He loved his enemies so much, he died for them. And that was really hard. So, but he did. did it so that we could have peace with God. So he did have enemies mm -hmm. and he did love them, but... He even died for them. Yep. Wow, that's intense. Yeah, and that's why Jesus wants us to love our enemies, because he loved his enemies, because that is living God's way. Like he said, always act like your father in heaven. So, you know, why don't you read Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48 yourself and think about how you can love your enemies. Bro, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just going to give this loving your enemies a go. I'm going to invite Cavendish to the party. Oh, that is nice of you, Scruff. Yeah, good, because then if we get hungry, we can always dip him in chocolate. <laughs> Scruff? Oh!
I don't know how many of you keep up to date with events that are happening around the world, but if you do, you might have heard of the radical Islamic group before, known as Boko Haram. If you're not familiar with them, they are the ones that are responsible for the kidnappings of those hundreds of school kids over the past decade in certain countries in Africa. They're also responsible for killing tens of thousands of people, for displacing more than 2.3 million others from their homes in Nigeria and also in other surrounding African countries. This group was at one time ranked as the world's deadliest terror group, according to the Global Terrorism Index. At the height of their activity in Nigeria, uh, a Christian pastor by the name of Hassan John decided one day that he was going to do something to stand up against them, but not in ways that you might expect him to. Pastor Hassan ministered out of this congregation in Nigeria, and this is actually a picture of his church. And this is actually a picture of him. So if you know anything at all about this story, then you might know that Baroko Haram had labeled Pastor Hassan as an infidel, and they had put a fairly significant price on his head. So I want you to imagine for a minute what that must have been like for him, because Pastor Hassan kept going to his church every day, not knowing whether that might be the day where somebody's going to kill him in order to collect this significant bounty that had been put on his head. The 54-year-old pastor had already lost two younger sisters to this group. He had witnessed a number of his friends killed right in front of him by this group, and he had escaped a number of different assassination attempts, again, by this group. But he was recently quoted as saying this. He said, you see it again and again and again. You get to places where the bombs planted by Muslim extremists have just exploded. And the carnage is all over the place. I visit both my Christian and my Muslim brothers and sisters in the hospital right after the violence. You go back and meet families. You cry with them. You console them. You do the best you can with them all the time. Yet isn't it interesting that even after having experienced all of that, the violence and the hatred, that none of that stopped him from reaching out to his Muslim neighbors? Because as he puts it, these are people who need Christ's love. You know, after he helped a young Muslim girl one day who couldn't afford to go to school because her father had been violently killed in a Boko Haram attack, Hassan started to reach out to other Muslim orphaned children. And soon that led to him helping uh, Muslim mothers. He started with 12 Muslim women and that quickly grew within a month to 120. And then young Muslim men in the area started coming to him and asking him for help as well. And with him leading the way, it really didn't take long before Muslims and Christians in that area were cooking together and eating together, all in an effort to recover from, from the violence that was all around them. You know, in a recent interview with Pastor Hassan, he was quoted as saying this. Now in Nigeria, eating together is a big thing. You don't eat with your enemy because you are constantly afraid that you will be poisoned by them. But now we are all interacting in this way, and it is just so marvelous. A local news reporter sort of covering his story commented on how he said, now if you only eat with your friends, it's no big deal, right? But if you eat with your enemies, people find that to be remarkable. And it really is a remarkable testimony, isn't it? And I don't know if there's a better modern day living example of someone who's living out this portion of the Sermon on the Mount that we're gonna be looking at today. I don't think there's a better example than Pastor Hassan. These past few weeks, we've been working our way through this, this powerful sermon of Jesus and have experienced the fact that Jesus is, is trying to help these people to understand how his new kingdom is different from the old religious way of trying to find favor with God. And he's just left this crowd intrigued as he went through the Beatitudes and then gave them these five incredibly relevant examples from the Old Testament law as to how his new way was better than the old way. 
And as we come to the end of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is about to shock them again with another radical teaching. And this time he's talking to them about their relationships with their enemies. And just before we unpack that passage, we're going to ask Zachary if he would read that passage for us. Hello, everybody. This is Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In most of your Bibles, Matthew 5, verses 23 to 28 is titled, Love Your Enemies. And let's be honest with each other, because strictly from a human perspective, this is a tough teaching. There's this great scene from the 1951 movie, The African Queen, where Rose Thayer, played by Catherine Hepburn, says to Charles Onlot, played by Humphrey Bogart, she says this, she says, Human nature, Mr. Onlot, is what God put us on this earth to rise above. And that relates closely to what it is Jesus is trying to get through to the people here on the side of this mountain. It relates to our relationship with our enemies. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to impact these people with. I can imagine that the crowd that was hearing Jesus say this for the very first time probably wondered if they had in fact misheard Jesus. Did he just say what I think he just said, they probably thought to themselves. And they would have struggled with these words because the people believed that what Jesus was teaching them at that moment, that it went against what the Jewish law taught. The people understood from the religious teachers that hating your enemies was, in fact, an acceptable response to someone who had hurt them or, in fact, wronged them. And Jesus starts off this passage by acknowledging that fact. In fact, he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And to understand where the Israelites got this idea from, we have to go all the way back to the book of Leviticus. Because Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, well, they read like this. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And this verse became the justification for it being all right in their mind to hate your neighbor. So where, in fact, did all of that go wrong? Well, in essence, the Jewish religious community made two mistakes when they were interpreting this particular law. The first mistake that they made was that they defined their neighbor as meaning only the people from their own country, community, or nation. They also defined their neighbor as those who shared in their common belief system. They defined their neighbor as being only those who they were in agreements with. By limiting their definition of neighbor, they justified living their lives in such a way that they believed that they were in some warped kind of way honoring God by holding grudges against those people who had wronged them. In fact, all throughout the Old Testament, this, this theological error was the cause of people being excluded from experiencing what really was the fullness of God. So if you weren't with them, then you were in fact cut off and you were shut out. So the second mistake that they made in interpreting this passage was that they inferred that they were supposed to hate their enemies. They inferred that it was in some way pleasing to God. In fact, they inferred that in some way that God's plan was to bless them for this kind of behavior. So when the author of Leviticus writes, love your neighbor, they figured that it was also saying, hate your enemy. And they had no clue that this was, in fact, 
the opposite of what God really wanted for them. Remember, Jesus said that he had come to do what in the Sermon on the Mount? Early on, he said, I have come to fulfill the law. And that's exactly what he's about to do in this passage. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, right? That's, in fact, what we just read. That's what the law said. That's what you read in Leviticus. But then he goes on in verse 44, and he says this. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying hate was never part of the plan. Hate was never God's purpose. His intent was for his followers. Uh, has, it's always been that they would lead the way by loving those people that God defines as your neighbors. That's always been God's intent. And I love how Jesus even justifies this new behavior. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Well, what does that mean? Well, this actually, this verse makes a lot more sense when you read it in the original language that it was written in. Because Jesus is talking here about how a good father really does set an example for his kids. Jesus is talking about how the best fathers, they lead by example. And they say to their kids, watch me. Watch what I do. Follow what I do. Watch how I live my life. And if we truly are his children, Jesus says that we will follow his example. We will emulate him. We will take on his characteristics. In fact, people will look at us and say, they are just like their dad. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. I love that. Jesus is also reminding them that the old way of do, doing things, you could get away with hate. And you were justified in holding on to anger and holding on to bitterness and holding on to grudges. That was the old way. But he's saying here in my new kingdom, that's not the way we are going to function. We're going to be so filled with love for those people who God defines as our neighbors that even our enemies are going to be encompassed into that. And how serious was Jesus about really helping these people to understand that? I mean, how often in his life and in his ministry did he end up talking to people about this? In John 13, verses 34, he says this. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And and this is the interesting part about this passage. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I love, again, what Jesus is saying in this passage here because he's telling us that in his new kingdom, our expressed love for our neighbor will be a defining characteristic as us, as his followers. That will define us. And if you think that we sometimes have a hard time truly grasping that and truly understanding it, I mean, can you imagine how this crowd felt hearing it for the first time? Jesus is telling them that I want this single thing to define you as my followers to the world. I want this to become your defining characteristic. I want you to stand out in the crowd because of this. So Jesus is saying, learn to love your enemies just as your heavenly father did. And you might be asking, well, what is that even referring to? But I think Paul reminds us of what that's referring to in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 verse 10 says this, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved through his life. And Jesus is reminding this crowd in the Sermon on the Mount that they need to follow the example of their heavenly father who, when they were his enemy, he loved them so much that he did whatever it took for them to be reconciled to him. And we should follow that example. You know, if you know anything about ancient Jewish history, then you might know that 
of all the 613 laws in the Old Testament, Jewish theologians argued most about which commandment was the greatest and which commandment was the most important. And Jesus answered that question one afternoon and said that it was this. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But then he paused and he said, running a close second to that one is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the people on that hillside listening to Jesus that afternoon as he was giving them this sermon, well, they were likely asking that same question as well after hearing Jesus say what he's just said. Who is my neighbor? And if you remember later on in Jesus' earthly ministry, he's confronted with that question again, this time by somebody who's only referred to as an expert in the Jewish law. In fact, in Luke 25, this guy words his question this way. It's very simple. Who is my neighbor? And what's fascinating about Jesus' response is that he answers him by telling him the story of the Good Samaritan. If you remember that story, it's a story about a man who was robbed and beaten up and and literally left for dead. And two people who should have been, by the Old Testament definition, his neighbor, Well, they walked by this dying man and they just simply refused to do anything to help him. And in the climax of this story, this third man, a a Samaritan who was the sworn enemy of this person, well, he was the one that stopped. He was the one that stopped to help. And he did more than just stop and help, but he went above and beyond in seeing that this man was brought back to health. And Jesus concluded that story with this, with this fascinating dialogue because he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus, who never missed the opportunity to hit home a point, looks at this expert, the law, and he says this, he says, go and do likewise. This is exactly the same point that Jesus is making to those who are sitting on the hillside with him that afternoon. He says to them, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He's saying, follow your heavenly Father's example. And right after that, in verse 46, he says this. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you get? are not even the tax collectors doing that. And I'm sure that that particular statement really hit home with Matthew, the writer of this book, because if you remember, he was a tax collector before Jesus called him to follow him. Jesus is saying here, there's nothing noble about being nice to people who are nice to you. There's nothing noble about eating a meal with people who um, are nice to you. He says everybody does that. But he goes on to say this in verse 47. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? And verse 48 is is a passage that, uh, a verse that books have been written on, what it is that Jesus meant by this. But verse 48 says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect. And the word that we translate as perfect in this passage is teleos. And in the ancient Greek language, this word carries with it this profound meaning of being complete or being in the process of becoming fully mature. It refers to someone who has achieved their full purpose or someone who has accomplished their goal. And I love that this is where Jesus is moving this entire conversation. Because the root of what Jesus is asking these people to do and the core of what he's asking them to become and the trait that he's asking them to perfect in their lives is what? It's love. It's interesting to me that the Greek word that's used for love in this sermon happens to be the word agape. And it's this kind of love that we often most think that's directed towards family members. You know, as one commentary describes the the meaning of this word, it says that agape seeks the highest good of all, no matter what they say about us. 
Agape seeks the highest good of all despite how they treat us. Agape seeks the highest good of all despite the extent to which they hate us. Agape seeks the highest good of all despite the demonic strategy that they employ to try and destroy us. Agape implies that the lover will seek the invincible peace and goodwill for all. And Jesus is really telling the crowd that. Jesus is telling the crowd that it's no longer enough simply to go through the motions with the people in our lives. It's no longer enough to simply say with your lips that you love them. It's no longer enough to simply love those who are easy to love. It's no longer enough. And we can't say that we love the way that Jesus is telling us to love without his supernatural in intervention in our lives. Jesus is saying something here that will become this common thread throughout so much of his earthly ministry. And he doesn't just say it with his words, but he modeled this for us. And as it relates to our relationship with our enemies, I mean, this is exactly what we are being called to do. We're being called to take off our old nature we're being called to throw off this old way of doing religion and to embrace this new kingdom that understands that our defining characteristic as followers of Jesus is now found in how we love people. Thinking back to the story that we started this message with, the story of Pastor Hussan, I mean, what was it, do you think, that made him able to love the way he did what is it, do you think, that made him able to care for people the way he did? I mean, what was it that made him so willing to, to sacrifice the way he did? What was it that pushed away the fear of losing his life and replaced that with this passion to reach the same people group that had put a bounty on his head? Was, it was his embracing of these words of Jesus that we have unpacked this morning. It was how the Holy Spirit took those words and encouraged him with what it tangibly meant to live that out in the community that God had placed him in. And my prayer this morning is that we would all have the courage to love others in that same way. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Romans 5, 10. Would you bow with me as we pray? Jesus, those are such powerful words and such transforming words. You know that there's a lot of us who, who spend our lives maybe holding grudges, holding on to hurts and things that have happened to us, holding on to anger, and Jesus, there's a very a profound statement for us in here about the importance of us learning how to let go of that and learning to love our enemies, learning to love those who persecute us, learning to love those people who aren't very nice to us. And, and Lord, we understand that that is a process. But Jesus, we also understand the profound message in this verse and that this is the defining characteristic that you want your followers to have. When the world looks at us, you want them to see this love and acknowledge that that's, that's unique. That's something the rest of the world doesn't offer. I pray, Lord, that if there's somebody listening to this this morning and maybe anger has been an issue for them, maybe they have enemies that they have just not been able to move on from and forgive. You're asking us to do a lot more than just move on and forgive. You're asking us to tangibly define what it means to love them. And Jesus, I just pray that if there's somebody watching this this morning that, that really needs to connect with that message, I ask that you would, you would touch them in a special way that your spirit would convict them and challenge them and mold them and shape them in a way that would make them better reflect what you are asking your standards, your, your, your followers to become here. Jesus, we commit this to you and we, we ask that your 
Holy Spirit would do a work in our hearts and a work in our lives so that we can be examples of this to the dying world around us. We commit this to you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, mm-hmm.